I have the honor to present a fellow midwife today to give us a presentation entitled The Psychological Well-Being Following Miscarriage from a Cell Trugenic Perspective. We have with us as our core presenter, Anne-Marie Rennie, who's a midwife out of the UK, currently in Scotland. She's been a midwife um, since the 80s and holding a variety of teaching positions, practice positions. She taught at Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen and was awarded a PhD, completing this in 2016. She's currently the project lead for recognition of prior learning at the NHS Education Scotland. And we will be with her and hope that you have lots of questions about this as we move forward. And Marie, over to you. Okay, thank you very, very much, Pandora, for that introduction. Um, as uh, has been highlighted, this study uh, was um, my PhD and I started in 2010 um, and uh, finished in 2016. I was teaching midwifery at the same time. Um, but uh, really, you know, obviously it was a topic um, that's very interesting for us as midwives. Um, and uh, so I was delighted to have been honoured uh, to receive a PhD studentship from RGU. Um, and what we know as midwives actually is miscarriage is common. Um, it's a, a unique experience for each individual. Um, there are the UK definition of miscarriage is when a pregnancy spontaneously ends before the 24th week of pregnancy with the frequency increasing with rising maternal age. But there are lots of different definitions of miscarriage. And what's really interesting is that um, this is a global conference. So I would really uh, be interested to know what your local definition of miscarriage is. Um, most occur in the first trimester, so within the first 12 weeks. <coughs> most, most miscarriages cannot be prevented. Um, and there's between 15 and 20% of clinically confirmed pregnancies that spontaneously end before um, the 13th week. Although this could actually statistically be higher because this doesn't include women that um, didn't know they were pregnant um, or didn't report their pregnancy. So, though, you know, it could essentially be um, higher than that. So what are the definitions globally? I'd be really interested to hear what your definition is. For example, I know uh, the WHO definition is uh, up till the end of the 23rd week, uh, but also weighing less than um, 500 grams. Um, I believe in um, Australia, it's up to 20 weeks gestation. Um, and, you know, so it, it's interesting when you've got different definitions for something that you want to uh, examine and explore, and you're looking at different research studies, um, when the definition is not um, always the same, it makes that uh, more complex when you try to compare study findings. Um, so I would be interested to know, obviously, here we've got South Africa at 24 weeks, um, um, but um, or also 26 weeks. So miscarriage could be anything up until the end of 26 weeks well that's you know a, again you know a larger um gestational age and what we do know is that as midwives when women are telling us about their experience of miscarriage uh, that it impacts on their psychological well-being um, some will obviously be devastated shocked and confused um, especially when there were no signs that anything was going wrong and they go along for their 12 week gestation um, scan uh, to be told that um, there's no fetal heart. Um, and, you know, the, the, the differences between responses um, could be any of these factors here, um, sad and tearful, numb, angry, jealous, um, self-blame and guilt. 
where they feel empty, a physical sense of loss or lonely, especially if people around them don't understand, um, and maybe a little bit panicky and out of control, not able to cope with everyday life. So there is, um, a, you know, a response that um, varies, and it's an individual response. So, you know, I think uh, what's important here is that uh, with that individual response, we need to respond individually. Um, and I'm sure you know as midwives when you when you're hearing somebody recall in uh, their next pregnancy about previous miscarriages that they often do get upset um, and being able to uh, talk about it uh, potentially might be uh, helpful. So in the UK we have nice guidelines which suggest. Uh, the offer of follow-up with a healthcare professional of woman's uh, of the woman's choice. Um, so what that follow-up looks like um, differs across the UK, and typically um, these are going to be women that um, are reaching out for some um, type of support. And so typically the midwife will contact the woman and visit to support her. Um, but I'd also be interested to know what happens elsewhere around um, is, is support offered in your area and how do women, how do midwives identify those in need of support and is asking them whilst they've um, just found out that they've had a miscarriage and then um, had any treatments and, and is it is that the right time to ask them are they able to uh, make sense of everything that's gone on and make a decision at that stage as to whether they will need support or not and certainly you know some low resource country settings there um, are issues around um, lack of midwives providing care during birth so it might be um, that you know it's not possible either and I can see um, in uh, South Africa that there's no professional support um, whereas um, when you've got a case loading model and that's really interesting. You you get to the women get to know you, and you get to know um, them. But some women don't want um, any; they just want to keep the the contact open. But there are issues around um, that offer of follow up support in the UK. So um, this study, why is it why is miscarriage why is it important that we find out more about miscarriage? Well, I think certainly raising awareness about women's psychological reaction um, is, is important. And certainly during education of um, student midwives and midwives, what were your experiences of learning about miscarriage? Um, I, when I trained back in 19, when I qualified in 84, um, we really didn't get much um, information about it at all. So, but the, the, the important thing is if it matters to women, then miscarriage should matter to midwives because midwife is with woman. It's not necessarily with woman um, with a baby, you know, a successful pregnancy, whatever. You know, it, it's it's about us being with woman and listening to what they're saying and and being supportive and um, understanding that in the next pregnancy there's going to be some women that are extremely anxious. So also. Um, you know, any opportunities we have to spend time with women in that relationship building, um, you know, that is uh, sometimes triggered during um, a, a, an event such as a miscarriage. So recurrent miscarriage, this is um, in the UK, the definition is three or more miscarriages in a row. And recent literature suggests that actually two in a row um, is recurrent um, and I'd be interested to know what your definition for recurrent mis miscarriage is but typically in the UK if you have three miscarriages in a row then um, you can see um, a, a professional who will do further tests to look for any underlying cause and no cause is um, found in about half of those cases um, but what we must remember is that many women go on to have a successful pregnancy um, and much of the research focuses on trying to find a cause or treatment to stop miscarriages happening. Indeed, um, 
a study, well, when they looked at uh, top 10 research uncertainties for miscarriage, a lot of the questions out there around miscarriage were looking at the cause of miscarriage, which, um, you know, sort of teases out this um, fact that, you know, is there anything that could be happening that could uh, be causing the miscarriage? But you can see that what types of emotional support, um, mental health impacts of miscarriage in the short and long term for the mother and the partner are important. Also, what types of emotional support are effective in preventing or treating women or their partners after a miscarriage? And what preconception tests or inter interventions prevent miscarriage, e.g. vitamin supplements, folic acid and mindfulness? And I'll come back to mindfulness. So you can see there's also fact, other factors there around, you know, is there anything um, like, for example, the male factors that might contribute towards a cause, um, what the appropriate investigations for women after uh, one, two or three or more miscarriages, um, any genetic or chromosomal abnormalities uh, that might be causing miscarriage, what about lifestyle factors, um, what about um, pre-existing medical conditions, um, what investigations are of true clinical value um, and what are the inter uh, effective interventions to prevent miscarriage, threaten miscarriage and recurrent miscarriage. So they're the top 10 research uncertainties and you can see a lot are focusing on cause and um, prevention. So my study uh, used a salutogenic approach which um, was a uh, originated from Professor Aaron Antonovsky. So instead of looking at factors uh, that cause ill health, um, it, you, you, you look at factors that support health and well-being. And it originates from the Latin salus, which is health, and the Greek genesis, which is origin. And under this umbrella, umbrella of um, assets for health and well-being, there are all these um, types of psychological um, assessments that uh, you know go under this salutogenic umbrella so you can see um, self-efficacy empathy attachment coping uh, locus of control um, hardiness gratitude learned hopefulness quality of life flourishing um, etc so you can you can um, see that there's lots of different uh, constructs there that might explain, help to explain um, what helps, uh, what enhances psychological well-being. So in my study, I used um, the HADS Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale. Um, I also used that alongside um, a well-being scale, which was the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale and some proposed moderator variables. I included health locus of control, um, perceived social support, coping styles, um, self-blame and resilience. And some of these um, had been used before in the miscarriage population. For example, the HADS hospital anxiety scale um, had, uh, had been used before, whereas the wellbeing scale hadn't been used in a miscarriage sample that I could find in the literature anyway. But um, I used mixed methods and I started off in phase one doing a quantitative study to determine the impact on psychological wellbeing and to try and identify some protective factors. Um, so first of all, I had a comparative sample a comparative study and this had women with miscarriage compared to women without miscarriage and the comparative sample without miscarriage were women who were of reproductive age um, but that had never had miscarriage and were not pregnant and the comparative study um, helped us I you know compare uh, across you know women with miscarriage and versus women without miscarriage. Stage two was a prospective study. So this was the miscarriage women, but I examined their changes over time on the psychological impact and identified predictors of enhanced uh, well-being at the different time points. 
So we recruited women um, for the miscarriage study in a early pregnancy assessment unit. And this includes women who obviously completed the baseline questionnaire shortly after miscarriage to uh, look at the initial impact. And then uh, we went back and asked the same women at six months, which potentially for some have been around the time of their due date had their pregnancy not ended in miscarriage. And then we went again and asked them at 13 months to avoid the anniversary effect. Um, and phase two was a qualitative study. So from uh, our sample of miscarriage women, we then explored the predictors of enhanced psychological well-being. So we did some analysis on the quantitative studies, identified the predictors, and then um, developed an interview topic guide informed by the quantitative findings to explore those factors that helped women adjust. Obviously, we had to go for full NHS ethics review. Uh, this was approved, but it was approved sequentially. So the quantitative study was um, sought initially because we knew what we wanted to ask, um, and then we went back and got a substantial uh, amendment to help them re-evaluate based on the questions we wanted to ask in the interview topic guide. And obviously the study um, was voluntary. Women were able and knew they were able to withdraw at any stage uh, and we received informed consent. They knew they were going to be followed up over, over time. The comparative sample uh, who were of reproductive age um, and these were recruited from a well-being, a women's um, uh, well-being uh, clinic. And uh, we got our respective sample, as I said, from the early pregnancy miscarriage unit. Obviously, it's a vulnerable, you're asking vulnerable women to, you know, share their experiences. And we wanted to make sure that we were mindful of the fact that if they were exceptionally anxious or depressed, scoring um, 11 or more on the hospital anxiety and depression scale, that the GP was notified. And women knew that, that if we were concerned about them, that we would share that um, uh, anxiety, that, you know, that, that we would share that, uh, maybe if they were anxious, we would share that with their GP. So, the results from the quantitative study showed that a significant proportion of women following miscarriage experience elevated levels of anxiety and depression and have lower well-being than women without miscarriage. So that was the uh, main um, comparative study. The over time, the prospective study over time at the three time points showed that well-being increases and depression appears to lessen but anxiety remains elevated. So there's a group of women who are anxious um, after miscarriage, and those that is statistically um, proven in this. The protective factors were, so women who weren't anxious had a higher internal health locus of control, had higher social support from significant other and family, had a higher task and a lower avoidant focus coping style and didn't self-blame. The other protective factor was higher resilience. So from that, we then did some um, logistic regression and found that the most strongly related to the well-being scale was resilience and to anxiety and depression was self-blame and avoidant coping style. And that sort of um, fits nicely with a lot of the psychological theories around um, self-blame being quite uh, a, a feature whereby, you know, it sort of um, becomes almost like it, it sort of doesn't help reduce, you know, when you're, you're blaming yourself for the miscarriage. Um, when we know, actually, there's no reason to do that. Um, we don't know what causes miscarriage. and uh, why would you blame yourself as you know we we know that um it's with some careful uh discussions uh, we can try to unpick some of that 
and an avoidant coping style when you you can't you don't want to think about it you don't want to talk about it um, that was a key feature to um, the anxiety and depression so the qualitative study really was uh, able enabled us to to look at how important uh, compassionate care is for women who experience miscarriage and here's a nice quote she took ages this is obviously the woman having her scan uh, she was just very gentle and just saying I'm sorry but it's not good news and then she said do you want to see the screen and she showed me on the screen and then we went through to the other room and she came through and sort of sat beside me and she was just nice just a lovely lady and you can see how important that sensitivity and compassionate care is so making sense a lot of women spoke about you know if you think about everything that's got to happen in the body to make a baby of course things go wrong um, but if you've got that avoidant focus coping style maybe you can't share how you're feeling um, you, you're not able to talk about it but women that are able to talk about miscarriage find actually when they're talking about it this woman says 12 people sat around a table and out of the 12 of you finding about eight had had a miscarriage if not more it helped her realize okay miscarriage is common but how many women know miscarriage is common it's a taboo subject. We can, you know, the, the, the impact of a significant other, you know, I, there's some lovely quotes here. I think he found it difficult at first because he didn't want to be upset himself because he didn't want to upset me. But then we do talk. We've talked through a lot of stuff. So we did in the end just talk it through. And here's another one. But we vowed we'd stick together and we would get there in the end. I would definitely say that it's made myself and her significant other stronger as a couple. And here's another a quote uh, from, you know, what, what one of the um, significant others said, just telling me that it would be OK and we would get a baby and not to blame myself. So you can see uh, the impact on the significant other and wider social support network um, is is a is a factor. But how how they work that through and make sense of it and, you know, some of the conversations that help. Um, you know is is demonstrated in this slide other helpful flat factors um, one woman spoke about how she blew up some balloons and wrote stuff on them and just let them out the back like it was kind of my way of like saying I know you should have been here but you're not um, also taking part in the research the research questions she says I don't know they really made me think about what I've gone through and I think that helped I would say that's probably been one of the key things. It was nice because I thought somebody's actually interested in me. So taking part in the research was, was helpful for some. What doesn't help? And I think, uh, you know, going back to that follow up, I think I was more surprised more than anything that there wasn't any follow up. So having um, that question asked, at a time when you you're still trying to get your head around what's actually happened it's difficult to make that decision as to whether you want follow-up support or not at that time um, so and obviously this woman can't even remember being asked uh, because she doesn't rec recall um, any follow-up being offered so also having sensitive locality for care not next to women with babies is really important and, and I, I know the unit that um, helped with the recruitment of the study they identified a back door that enabled people to leave the maternity hospital um, in a sensitive way where they didn't have to walk through um, a busy antenatal clinic with lots of pregnant women so they were very quick to respond um, and they also um, have a, a memorial garden 
and you can see here i still think there should be like i don't know a memorial thing or something and after this research um a, a, a memorial garden was set up so that you know there, there can be a, a place where people can go and uh, acknowledge their loss over time i mean i was going back to women roughly 14 15 months after their miscarriage and quite a few of them got upset when they were sharing their experiences uh, this one woman said, I went to the toilet and there was blood and it was horrible. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to cry. And she's apologising for actually, you know, probably something that she maybe would have benefited to have shared, you know, an earlier stage. But, um, you know, do we really know about the long term impact of miscarriages? And I'd be interested to know what your experiences are um, around uh, around this topic. So over time. Um, this study did show some women were anxious. So the implications, well, obviously miscarriage is important to women and their partners and their families. Um, it's an individual response for women that requires an individual response by midwives um, or healthcare or, or other healthcare support workers. But communicating sensitively and spending time with women, allowing them to share how they're feeling, um, is always going to be um, beneficial. So supportive, loving relationships um, in terms of you know being supported by a significant other, someone to talk to who understands and listens, uh, realizing that miscarriage is common helps you also to realize that well, if they're all having miscarriages, then I'm not blaming myself you know it's not something i've done um, having a plan and an internal health locus of control so having some sort of plan um, for the future um, and also looking internally at uh, you know is there anything i can do to optimize my health and well-being and that comp compassionate care uh, that is supportive within an individual ind individualized approach um, Miscarriage matters, it's common, one in four at least. There's often no underlying cause. Many women adjust well, many go on to have a baby. And this study shows us that anxiety is an issue for some women. And they're going to be the women that come back in the next pregnancy. Those that are not anxious, do not self blame, are resilient, feel able to express their emotions and talk about their experiences of miscarriage. They have a plan and they're supported by their significant other and family. And I think in the future, further research is needed, um, which is conducted um, adequately powered uh, randomized control trials for the effectiveness of psychological follow-up for women following miscarriage and it's recommended that standardized psychological assessments are used um, to compare across studies but that we should be identifying those in need of follow-up because if we include all women in a randomized control trial then the diluting effect of having women that are not anxious in a sample that would maybe be testing on things like mindfulness or cognitive behavioral therapy or um, follow up support tailored to um, share, uh, enable women to share their feelings. Um, that um, impact, the effect might well be diluted. Um, we've also got to consider, obviously, cultural contexts. And in some countries, um, you know, the role of extended families. Uh, might uh, be you know important to consider so looking across um, cultures would be beneficial the miscarriage association in the uk is a great contact for information and support but many women feel not able to pick the phone up it's difficult for them to um, pick the phone up they have got a simply say campaign which is um, about telling the public about what they should be saying if they've experienced miscarriage um, 
and what they shouldn't be saying. So there's a hashtag say or hashtag don't say, um, and this enables women to say this is what you should be saying or this is what you shouldn't be saying. But they do provide um, a really good amount of information uh, and support for women who experience miscarriage. But a lot of women might find that difficult, particularly if they've got an avoidant, a focused coping style. Um, I am sharing this in case anybody out there is feeling um, that they want to share their feelings. They might not have experienced miscarriage per se, but um, you know, the Samaritans are um, a UK uh, support resource for people who feel um, you know, very, very distressed. And I know this is a distressing topic, so I just wanted to make sure that uh, people know that um, you know, if they felt that they wanted to write an email help them um, through a difficult time, then there is um, either a phone call or joe at samaritans.org um, to speak to. Um, obviously, women took part in this study and they generously gave up their time to share their experiences. Um, there were midwives and nurses who helped with the recruitment, um, so I want to obviously thank them. Um, my PhD supervisors, um, Dr. Katrina Forbes Mackay, Dr. Sarah Henderson, Professor Susan Klein, and Dr. Valerie Shealeith, because it was quite a complicated um, topic, uh, we had uh, their expertise, but also Professor Grant Cumming, who runs the Early Pregnancy Assessment Network um, across uh, Scotland. So he, he provided the expert um, guidance and support too. And obviously, I'm very grateful to the Robert Gordon University for awarding me the PhD scholarship, which enabled me to um, do the study. Um, and uh, the Iolanthe Midwifery Trust also gave me an award. Um, and Tommy's UK charity are uh, particularly interested in research into miscarriage. Um, and I've obviously used some of their resources, but they're a great resource for information. Um, and I can see some of your responses here, that silent grieving, um, uh, you know, is, it, it is silent grieving because women can't often, you know, they, they, they don't talk about being pregnant until they've got over that 12 weeks. Um, and so lots of people don't know, you know, why somebody's gone off sick or, you know, why somebody's upset. And, and it's that sort of tabooness of miscarriage which makes it difficult. So miscarriage matters. It matters to midwives, it matters to women, it matters to their partners, and it matters to their families. Um, and all I want to say is thank you very much for joining me. Uh, a very special thanks to um, the Virtual International uh, Day of the Midwife Conference organizers, in particular, um, Pandora and Linda Wiley, who've been uh, very supportive and you know obviously do an amazing amazing job but um, so I can just going down at the questions um, I can see can you say a bit more about mindfulness um, and you know I think that you, what are your experiences Ali Hello. Yeah, it's a useful tool for women. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it, it, we need more research um, around whether mindfulness will reduce anxiety. Um, I know certainly as a midwife, um, seeing women in the next pregnancy who've been really anxious just by looking at their body language and you know that um, sometimes it's just being able to see you more frequently because often when they come to see you after they've been to see you as a midwife they feel much more relaxed you help to allay fears and i do recall one woman saying to me um, that she would like to you know see me more often uh, and would that be possible and i said i can see you as often as you feel you need to see me and she was um you know i saw her regularly until she felt more able to uh, feel confident that things were going to go well. And I think I saw her probably at least every week until she was about 24 weeks. And, you know, as midwives, it's not always um, 
about you know do it, looking after somebody's physical health but also it's really important that we look after their psychological health yeah so i'm just looking at some of your yeah mindfulness is helping women and midwives and i think you know that uh, what we probably need is like a randomized control trial for women that are anxious um, and then target them and andrea my mum had a miscarriage many years ago and never pro pro processed the grief of the loss of her baby as no one ever asked her about it so there you go andrea that's uh, just goes to show how important this topic is um uh, for us as midwives i think you know we are the avenue for women uh, and women's health to help them um make sense of things and um, it's really important that they don't blame themselves for something that actually um is is common and often there's no cause so and marie are there any specific reading materials that you might recommend for a midwife who is wanting to delve a little bit further into providing compassionate care yeah and um, that's a, a good question um i would say that if you look at the um miscarriage association there's some really good information there and tommy's uh uk charity they have uh there in the previous slides they have a website with information for professionals as well um so that's tommy's uk charity research into miscarriage and i think um, you you'll have uh, great resources there um, around sensitivity and sensitive care. Okay. Um, as we look at what's happening in the public media, we can see that stars, you know, from Beyonce coming out about her miscarriage and then her near miss to Celine Dion, um, they've all been sort of coming forth lately about their miscarriage. Do you think that this is helpful in shifting the paradigm have you seen that shift with them all talking yeah about i mean absolutely now? yeah i mean obviously celebrities um it, it's good that anybody is talking about miscarriage because what people don't know is how um how common it is and how how complex it can be um to make that adjustment and i think that learning from women who um have experienced miscarriage so being able to talk about it um and share how they feel um it is cathartic in itself so um and you know obviously when celebrities start talking about it that's got to be a good thing it makes you realize actually because other people have miscarriage that it is common Quite, quite common. And it's heartwarming to see that even some of the older celebrities, such as Barbara Walters, etc., you know, are still coming out um, and hoping that too, that can help to heal perhaps some of the, you've mentioned the, the long-term loss that women may feel, um, about never having been able to talk about this and so that women don't go to their grave, so to speak. Um, having. Yeah having having helped you know having having been able to you know say goodbye and acknowledge their their loss um and i think that a lot of uh charities are really um a lot of sorry a lot of uh maternity units uh, early pregnancy assessment units are much more mindful now of that need to provide some way of um, helping people make sense of what's happened being able to speak absolutely andrea absolutely support groups might be helpful so in some areas uh you know setting up a support group um you know and i think that there's no one particular thing that's going to suit everybody i think some women are going to want uh to um uh, go to a support group or some might want to um, access online blog type support uh, where they're anonymous but they can share how they feel um you know that there could be um you know other areas you know everybody needs to be treated uh, as an individual thank you very much any last comments or questions uh, 
I mean, obviously, well, it's really interesting to be able to see uh, what what's going up in the comments, and there's obviously great um, uh, sensitivity amongst us as women um, in the group. And I think that looking at uh, see the North of England now offers support and memory boxes for miscarriage and early pregnancy losses. Um, so it, anything that will will help is is the way forward. But we need more randomized, you know, randomized control trial. Well, thank you for discussions on this topic. You know, we've learned that it's really not as uncommon and that we as midwives have a huge role to play in supporting women through the isolation and yeah. attempting to break past the taboos, you know, and the feelings of I did something wrong that can be a part of this as we yeah. care for women throughout their life cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we thank each and every one of you for joining us. Uh, we invite you as well to continue to join us throughout the day. We have a few more sessions that will be lined up for the afternoon, uh, evening, or depending upon which side of the world that you're joining us from. And knowing as well that there are evaluations um, that can be done and we're happy this year to be able to get a certificate of participation um, for our time together. You can see on our chat box here that the survey is up in terms of giving feedback about this topic and other topics that you might perhaps enjoy seeing coming up in further future virtual international days of the midwife. Jude Field will be presenting in room two. Uh, we thank you all for joining us as we are with women for a lifetime. Fantastic. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Be thank well. you everybody. Thank you all for joining us.